Hey everybody, welcome. This is JSA TV and JSA the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Jamie Scott Okutaya, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, thank you for joining us during these very difficult times as we continue to face down COVID-19 by social distancing and by working, learning, and networking virtually. As such, these JSA TV virtual monthly roundtables have really taken on a, a new form of relevancy as a timely platform where we can seek advice and information, even answers to our questions from, from top industry thought leaders as we face these latest challenges of today's new reality together. Also, hopefully a little sunshine for you today at your door. We have <laughs> provided lunch or if you chose a gift card to a local restaurant for the first 100 registrants. So for those of you who received, please enjoy your JSA lunch while we get started here. And a quick reminder, this is a roundtable format. We want to hear from you. We wanna hear your voice. We wanna help answer those questions. So please go ahead and type questions you may have for our panelists right into that question box. Depending on time, we'll get to as many as possible. And the last 15 minutes of the hour, we're gonna take our conversation over to LinkedIn for a chat with many of our speakers. So go ahead and go to LinkedIn, search for hashtag JSA virtual roundtables, and our feed will come up. We're also going to uh, put that right in the chat box for you too, so, so we'll get that as well. Um, but we have a great opportunity there to review any great questions that we might not have had a chance to cover in the next 45 minutes. So go ahead and post those questions and thoughts to our panelists on LinkedIn chat as well. And a note, this is JSA's third in a series of necessary conversations right now on the impact of COVID-19 to our industry and target verticals. Next one up is COVID-19 and its impact on healthcare networks. That roundtable just three weeks away, May 7th, 1 p.m. That's Eastern time. Go ahead and check us out on jsa.net. You can register and let us know if you have any additional speaker suggestions as well. Again, we wanna hear from you. So let's get started. Today's topic, smart cities and IoT in the new world of COVID-19. And just to underscore the importance of today's chat, we have over 250 registrants joining us today. Thank you guys. Thank you community for your continued support of these series. We should also note that within a day of announcing this topic, we had each of our all-star executives dedicate their time for us today, which I'm truly grateful for. Thank you, my panelist friends. And to help us introduce them and to guest moderate our panel, please welcome Peter Murray. He's the executive director of Dense Networks. Dense Networks is a social think tank focusing on IoT, mobile bandwidth, cloud, and big data transforming our society, which, as, as it happens, makes Peter a perfect guest moderator for our conversation today. Pete, thank you, and the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Um, really pleased uh, to be part of this uh, uh, this uh, webinar. Um, uh, my background, yeah, as, as you said, um, I, I go way back. I'm, I'm an early MCI guy. I was uh, the original uh, general manager of uh, WinStar, and I built all sorts of networks all over uh, the United States. Um, taught at Temple University, and now my organization, uh, we focus on how cities are utilizing connectivity and information technology to, as we call it, getting to smart, right? Where it's a process and uh, ne never before, you know, have you experienced anything like we're experiencing now. And some of these technologies we've been talking about and focusing on and seeing pilots are never more relevant. Um, this group you've put together here of experts uh, is really particularly relevant because they have a, a um, each has a different expertise within this, uh, within the stack, if you would. So. Uh, with that, uh, why don't I go ahead and uh, introduce uh, Kyle Hildebrand and have Kyle talk a little bit about himself and his organization. Sure, you bet. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'm Kyle Hildebrand. I'm the Vice President of uh, Project Development and Sales for EX Squared Technology. Um, we're a design, build, operate, maintain, and commercialize uh, a firm. Uh, we specialize in communications, intelligent transportation systems, and smart city infrastructure. Uh, I'm, I'm hunkered down here today from uh, eastern Nebraska where it's snowing, so I'm jealous of all the other panelists who are in uh, sunnier, warmer places. Um, you know, 
I've been impacted much like everyone else here on this panel and probably listening into their home. We're following our, you know, social distancing recommendations and we're doing the best we can to be, you know, responsible, um, you know, amid the crisis. So I'm looking forward to this today. Thanks. Excellent. And uh, Isak, uh, if you would as well, um, uh, please introduce yourself. Tell us a little about where, where you are and how you're experiencing uh, this uh, <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you, Peter. So uh, it's Akmiya, Vice President of Sales Engineering here at um, Redline Communications. Um, currently bunkered down in uh, Oakville, Ontario, Canada, um, just about 40 miles uh, west of Toronto. Um, it's about 37 degrees outside right now. Um, and uh, how coping with it? So basically working from home, it, it's been uh, sort of, um, the word I'll use is strange. It's been a strange experience because I've uh, joined Redline uh, about three months ago. I have yet to meet any of uh, my colleagues, my peers face to face. <laughs> so it's all virtual. So that's been, uh, you know, it, it's a unique time that we're all going through. Yeah, certainly is a transformative. Uh... And some of the cities that I talk to, uh, you know, they, they range from panic to inspired uh, by, by this crisis. Uh, so we'll talk about that some more. Uh, Robert, uh, you certainly have a lot of experience with cities and infrastructure. Uh, you want to talk a little bit, a bit about Highland and yourself? Sure. Th uh, Jamie, thank you for having me, Peter. Thank you. Um, I'm Robert DeLeo, the chairman of Highland. I've been with Highland for 30 plus years, just about my entire career. Um, Highland, if most of you don't know, Highland's a full turnkey provider, a wireline, wireless, smart city infrastructure, uh, electrical infrastructure projects. Um, we currently today, you know, a lot of you know us from, from the New York City market. Um, currently today, we're operating under four divisions. Um, our New York City market is, is uh, Highland Datacom and Electrical, still the original base unit. Um, which operates uh, and controls New York City, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Connecticut. Uh, we have a company called Down Under Construction uh, that does our Virginia, D.C., Baltimore market. Um, in the greater uh, Chicago area, Illinois market, uh, a company called Western Utility. Um, uh, and out west, we have a rebranded company called Highland West, uh, which does our Northern California market, our Southern California market. Uh, Phoenix and Utah and some other areas. Um, well, our primary focus is um, a lot of smart city stuff, a lot of uh, small cell network building, all pretty much on uh, deploying construction for all of these uh, all of these uh, types of uh, units and projects. Uh, I'm Excellent. down here from uh, Jupiter, Florida. Um, been here for a little bit. Um, um, eager to eager to get back up north um, to one to thank the team uh, in person because we have a lot of people in the you know uh, that are essential to our projects and are and are working and building uh, these these and keeping our networks up and going. Yeah, it's, it's um, yeah. Well, fortunately, I guess uh, for you, you yeah, you're in Jupiter here rather than in New York, hunkered uh, down. Uh, um, stay safe. Um, and Scott, uh, please, uh, if you would, I will also Scott Ward is with us. And Scott, if you would uh, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your organization. Sure. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Scott Ward here. I'm a tech guru at TBI. Um, with over 3,000 partner agents and 150 vendors, TBI is one of the top master agents in the channel community. With many, uh, you know, with so many vendors to work with, um, we take an agnostic approach to solving technical problems for our end customers, and that includes all the verticals. For the past 13 years, I've designed over a thousand solutions uh, covering network, connectivity, telecom, colocation, but I try to focus uh, and, and really kind of hone in on the cloud, security, SD-WAN, IoT, and disaster recovery space these days. Um, I'm based out of Houston, Texas. Uh, I have a home office here, so I'm used to working remote. Uh, and of course, down here we have some hurricanes, so hunkering down is not that all uncommon. Um, we just typically don't do it for this long. 
But um, the impact to me obviously is not quite as uh, severe as it is to others. Uh, just the lack of travel, I guess, is the biggest difference. Uh, we like to see partners and, and customers. We like to get out in front of them. Um, but for now, we're just doing more video conferencing, phone calls, and emails. Okay, well, um, let's dive in. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about in this uh, very vast field. Um, so uh, my group, as I said, we produced the Connected Cities Tour, which is our fifth year. Uh, we were scheduled to do 16 events this year. Uh, most likely we'll do six to eight uh, because of the situation. Um, but we're at the www.connectedcitiestour.com. But we research, uh, particularly we look at um, public safety, transportation, utilities, and real estate, and how those come together in the smart city. Um, so with that, you know, a city is made up of these different uh, uh, large ecosystem and different uh, parties. Um, how, what have you seen in your market or your company seen in some of the cities you serve in terms of uh, were they flat footed and how have they um, how have they reacted to this uh, this crisis? Uh, let's start with Kyle. Sure. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so for me, um, you know, I. I I, I live in Nebraska, so we don't have a shelter in place or a mandatory stay at home order, but most people are being uh, socially responsible. You know, they're, they're only leaving home for the essentials. You know, I think it's, it's similar to that in most places where, you know, the, you know, other than, you know, emergencies and, and to get some essential supplies, you're, you're kind of hunkered down. Um, I, I think everyone was caught off guard. I don't think anybody would, uh, would have been or could have been prepared for how quickly this this happened, um, you know. And I, I don't think anyone can be anyone in a you know a particular metropolitan area can be to blame for how things how things have worked out. But I think overall, I think the spirit um, of of overcoming the obstacle is out there, and I, I see it everywhere. I'm used to you know traveling, but now I'm you know I'm sitting at home doing doing conference calls and 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 videos, and, and that it's it, it's not. Um, it's not that much different. Um, we're still interacting. We're finding a way to overcome things, but uh, I, I feel pretty fortunate. I, frankly, I, I, I know no one who has had the had the virus, and and I'm you know I hope it hope it stays that way. So you know, I hope everyone well, out there can stay stay healthy. Well, let me ask Rob, yeah, let me ask Robert then. Uh, Robert, you have a large organization in multi city, uh, but you know your your heritage is New York City, and you have a, a cluster of uh, employees there. So what 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 have you, has your company been called on by New York City to help uh, with the emergency or what what are you you seeing uh, um, firsthand well, there? We haven't been called on uh, by New York City. The only thing we do for the city we do some critical um, like traffic signal maintenance projects for them, which you know currently have to we we have to stay deployed at those projects. Um, we are still working a lot of uh, essential projects. We, we have probably have about 80% of the workforce uh, working. Um, we have, you know, we had to adapt a lot and, 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 and um, you know, because a lot of our projects are, are team projects where you have multiple guys on the same projects or multiple guys in the same trucks. So, we, you know, we've had to adapt and, and, and uh, go by the CDC compliance of, you know, being six feet apart and masks and, um, so we are uh, trying to stick to all the essential projects that need to get built and stay away mm -hmm. from the ones that don't need to. I mean, certain 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 projects have have uh, stopped um, um, because of just they're they're not essential and there's no need to put uh, guys in harm's way. Well, let me jump in for a second on that because you said um, you you work on traffic systems and you know we're looking at this crisis, but let, let's go to the bigger topic and. What is smart? You know, when you guys say you work on smart city, what's the difference there? You know, we, we know physical connectivity, but what is that? What is the make smart when you, you guys go to work? You know, so, for example, for us, we're, we're building we're building kiosks in New York City, um, which today you'll, you'll, you'll see them. They, they, they replace the old phone boots. Um, so they have fiber connectivity. They have free Wi-Fi on, on, on the units for uh, for the pedestrians. Um, we build um, uh, smart street lights, um, which traffic signals also as well, which have communication back to a central office, knowing whether signals out or, or, or you know, not functioning properly. Um, obviously, we put uh, small cells on our street light poles, which we bring fiber to. Um, thousands of those in the New York City have been deployed. 
Um, we do um, information boards on highways, um, which all have fiber connectivity. Um, I know we'll talk a little bit about ITS, um, but we do uh, security cameras throughout the cities, um, some, some for, for private networks just for uh, security for, for the city uh, themselves or, or for, you know, uh, people can, can view the, the cams as well. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, your company does a, a, a lot of work I'd, I'd classify as smart. Uh, you want to expand on what, what smart means uh, from the perspective of your organization? Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, smart, if, if we take a step back, look at it uh, at a high level, um, it, it's all about the, the need is situational awareness of every asset out there in real time. Okay, that's that's what you want. You want to be aware of the status of every asset out there. Um, and when I say asset, if I look at industries like utilities or mining, oil and gas, you know, uh, a mining truck out there, a transformer out there, you want to be aware of their state uh, in real time. Now, how do you do that? That's a lot of data that you collect and they use the term big data for it. Uh, you cannot expect a human being to be uh, at the end of that big data pipe and you know receiving and analyzing data in real time so ai comes into play and you know ai and big data if you don't add connectivity to the infrastructure out there then it's just something you do in a lab so you know the, uh, from our perspective without connectivity uh, you know smart i'll say it doesn't mean much it's it's connectivity that actually enables it um, uh, so that's what we focus on, and our focus then is, uh, you know, wireless connectivity for industrial environments. So that's the, you know, high end, the, the environments where you need high reliability, uh, uh, you need, you know, very low latency, you need high security. Uh, so for example, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say I lose connectivity right now at my home, internet. What's the economic cost of this versus um, you know, an autonomous vehicle in a mine loses connectivity. You know, that's like it, because one truck stops, every truck behind it stops. That's a million dollar an hour economic cost to the business. Uh, so that's what smart means to us. It, it's having that operation, uh, you know, in, in, in real time, constant, uh, you know, 24 7, 365 days a year. Yeah, and I think that you, you hit on a number of key issues. One of them is situational awareness. Um, I was recently in a um, an autonomous vehicle trial here in Orlando, and uh, the, the law, though, requires the shuttle not go above 12 miles per hour. So it has to go on a live road. So they had to build cut-ins to the live road so that the shuttle could pull over and let traffic go by it because of this mixture of, of uh, environments, right? The trial environment, the pilot environment versus the live environment. Um, but part of you mentioned also was was pulling all the data together in security. Um, Scott, your company is is uh, really focused on the cloud and cybersecurity, um, and much of what is smart is either going to reside in the cloud or at the edge, right? So, what are the trends, and how 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 does your company approach uh, smart? So. Yeah, so <laughs> smart to TBI um, means for us an opportunity uh, to help customers imagine, innovate, and create cutting edge solutions to current and future problems. Um, but it also means, uh, you know, to usher in a new age of technology um, to help customers uh, strategically grow their business or improve their community. And um, it also is to help them uh, just simply do things better, faster, more secure and more efficiently. Now, for you know the city of Houston in particular, um, you know it means a future, right? The ability to make quicker decisions uh, or to mitigate problems or eliminate problems, um, where self-driving cars are going to be mainstream. Uh, it means innovation. So you know all the different projects that are going to go on, uh, for like intuitive and automated traffic control systems or parking guidance. So folks can find out exactly where parking is available and not have to drive all over town endlessly looking for a space, uh, right? But it also means notoriety. Mm -hmm. um, they want to attract folks to the city and make it a desirable place uh, to live through technology. 
Um, but it also means, uh, you know, I mentioned the hurricanes earlier, it also means the ability to, to recover quickly and fully in case of a natural disaster like a storm or flooding uh, or a pandemic uh, or something man-made like a terrorism, act shooter situations, or something like an industrial uh, oil and gas explosion. Yeah, I mean, that, that continuity is essential, particularly during these crisis periods. Uh, I remember after the series of hurricanes, um, one of uh, our colleagues, uh, he was a commander, uh, Kurt Jacobs in the Navy, he was assigned to FEMA. And the biggest issue with uh, communications uh, crashing was fuel to the, the towers, right, to keep the power mm -hmm. on, to keep the network up. Uh, this was something that could have been monitored with a simple IoT sensor. Instead, they were flying in Puerto Rico, they're flying helicopters and dropping people down by rope, right, to keep the networks running so that they keep uh, literally the lights on. Um, Kyle, you, when we talk about smart, your company um, dabbles, and I, I shouldn't use dabble, your, your company's experts um, in the ITS uh, area. Uh, talk about that from a smart, because I, that's certainly one of the areas that I think has got the most impact uh, uh, that people will feel and that, the outcome. Sure. Sure. So, you know, smart, smart, I think, means a little bit different thing to every, every different person. And so um, when it comes to smart, uh, the, the one core thing that brings it all together and makes everything smart is that connectivity. And we've, we've kind of touched on that. But when it comes to things like intelligent transportation systems, um, you know, they are they are they are only as good as the, the backbone of connectivity that you have. So whether that's a fiber network or a wireless network, you take all those different types of sensors um, and, you, and you bring them together. People can make real time you know, decisions on how things are happening. And those, some of those decisions can be automated for efficiency. So when you, when you apply that, that communications backbone to those sensors, um, you know, it, it creates a, a better traveling experience or, or better experience for, you know, society in general. I'll give you an example. One of the intelligent transportation systems that we've deployed is a statewide, uh, truck parking information management system across the state of Iowa. So in, in pretty much real time, um, any type of driver or professional driver or dispatcher will be able to tell somebody in real time through that intelligent transportation system, um, either by a, a web app, a third party app, a state 511, and in some places there, uh, some states have signs, uh, it tell them where they can park and it makes their, makes their life a little bit better as they plan their day. And so it, you know, intelligent transportation is really inherently smart, but, but the backbone of that is the, the communications infrastructure. Do you guys um, work in the V to I space? Is that something that's coming up yet? Um, not, not really. So, so we're we're more focused on on putting you know the communications infrastructure into place and the the applications and the physical devices and sensors, the data collection sensors that sit on top of that, and we we process okay. uh, or we hand that information off to be processed. Um, on the ConnectedCitiesTour.com, uh, our site. Um, there's four tabs uh, in the home page, and one of them is transportation. And if you click on it, uh, we've profiled four cities, um, and one of those cities is New York City. Um, the reason we profile them is they all got federal grants to experiment with connected vehicles and autonomy, and, and uh, New York was one of those. Um, so we profiled, we actually had Cordell Schachter, who is the CTO of New York City's Department of Transportation, uh, keynote our New York event uh, last year. Um, and he related a lot about that. But Robert, you guys are playing in there, that space. Um, what, you, are you familiar with V2I? And is that something that's coming up now in the connected uh, car and any of that? Are you being asked to do that type of work? Uh, no, but we have we've have laid a lot of infrastructure uh, along these highways uh, for it. So we've built a lot of backbone fiber. And as Kyle mentioned, uh, you know, any of these networks are only as good as as their connectivity. And you know, the, the more we can push fiber deeper into all these devices and, and these highways and streets, a lot of these things will, will perform a lot better. Yeah, and you're going to see the movement of the data capability out to the edge, uh, basically because of the latency that's required in the, and the massive amount of bandwidth. Uh, Intel said uh, the average vehicle, autonomous vehicle, will generate four terabytes of data per day. Right, so imagine for the connectivity industry. Now all that won't go out. Some will stay at the edge. Some will be vehicle to vehicle. So I've been using a term called V to I. Um, that means vehicle to infrastructure. So once we have all this connectivity in place, uh, your Audi uh, using one system can communicate 
uh, to the stop sign and the Volkswagen coming, the Germans have done a bit, a bit more in this space, and the Volkswagen coming the other direction is communicating to the stop sign. And if one of the drivers is drunk and, and is falling asleep, the stop sign communications will tell the vehicle to come to a stop. It will anticipate the speed of that vehicle and know that it's running too fast. And, it, and the system will take over, sort of a Tesla uh, with uh, communicating to a uh, stop sign like Tesla. So right. we'll talk about that a little bit more, but these advanced technologies are what is shaping and transforming the cities. There's not a lot of firms that really have a full grasp on how to do all this. Um, Isaac, uh, your firm, uh, exper not exper your firm uh, actually deploys and, and is familiar with uh, intelligent video, LIDAR, uh, thermal. Can you talk about that space and how that's transforming in public safety and other areas? Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, Redline has been uh, uh, deploying video surveillance networks uh, for our customers for, you know, almost two decades now. Um, so, uh, uh, historically, uh, they were more based on nomadic technologies. Uh, now, it, it's more, uh, you know, we're looking at 4G, 5G uh, for that. Um, you know, what we are seeing, though, and since the topic today is also COVID-19, what we have seen in the past couple of months, uh, not as much in Europe and North America, because privacy is a bit of a concern here, I guess, but cities, uh, governments requesting, um, you know, that kind of uh, network uh, infrastructure uh, capabilities, um, uh, you know, in other parts of the world. Uh, that I'd say in the past couple of months, we've seen a significant increase there. Uh, you know, we've seen what China, Taiwan, or, um, you know, Singapore, Hong Kong, these uh, cities and countries have done uh, with the uh, connectivity technology in, in their response to COVID-19. Um, so from that perspective, uh, you know, our expectation is that this is going to grow uh, significantly. And, you know, the chances are that uh, you know, with that, the other piece, you know, especially in the 5G world, um, that will take uh, preference uh, over others uh, is this whole, whole, you know, working from home that we're doing right now. You know, um, high bandwidth, uh, every part of the um, uh, country uh, that is required. And speed of deployment is critical in this. Fiber to the home takes time. Uh, so, yes, it is an option where, you know, cities already, dense cities have that fiber infrastructure, so it's, it's doable easily. Uh, but as you go towards the edge, um, having that kind of uh, connectivity infrastructure is, is um, you know, much easier to deploy via wireless connectivity. So, hence, we see the growth in, in that perspective. We see one of the um, smartest guys that I know who's been speaking on our tour is uh, Mark Jules, he's the vice president of a group called Smart Spaces Video Intelligence um, at Hitachi. And uh, what they do is um, they create, the, instead of smart city, they create smart spaces. And they blend a series of technologies that help with a, what you call situational awareness, um, which allows law enforcement and city government, utility others, to really um, real-time monitor situations and there are technologies today, like thermal imaging, uh, that could literally, uh, I don't know if you're following uh, Governor Cuomo's uh, daily briefs, but a couple of days ago, he just suddenly exclaimed, every business owner is going to want to know the temperature of everybody who walks through his door. How do you do that? He said, you're just like that. And I said, God, I love this guy. That's a commercial right there for thermal imaging. Right. I mean, my yeah. goodness, it's a pretty off the shelf uh, uh, type of technology when married to our analytics now that could, without, you know, uh, being too intrusive, help identify people during this time. Right. So there are other technologies. And again, and we, you know, we can get into civil liberties. But another one that's cropping up quite a bit, intelligent transportation is LIDAR. Kyle, do you see any of that type of application yet? Um, or the cities, I don't, I don't see many cities, most of the car companies are experimenting with that now. You're muted. 
I apologize. I had to unmute it. Uh, so, so, so go. that seems to be more, uh, more of a, a private sector activity right now than specifically the cities. Mm -hmm. But, but as, as they have to, you know, develop it and integrate it, you know, you have to get those cities and departments of transportation and, and state agencies on board, uh, to fully vet those t technologies out. And so, so it's happening and, it, and it's happening at a, at an accelerated pace. And I, I don't know that, um, you know, technology is going to keep innovating, so I don't know that any type of pandemic will will really slow that down. Technology is going to evolve, you know, how it does. You know, I think we're going to just find new applications now that um, our concerns are shifting, right? What is, uh, after 9-11, our concerns, right, and how we modified our security, I think we're going to add these healthcare concerns to our security concerns. Uh, uh, but on the practical side, Robert, you guys um, are deploying cameras and, and other um, other gear and, and building these networks along the roadways and other parts of the city. Uh, is this a major growth curve? Or what type of applications do you see growing? Uh, yeah, well, it's, what, it, it, it's been growing for us for the past couple of years. We we don't see it uh, we don't see it slowing down because of COVID nineteen. Um, I actually think uh, you know when we come out of this, we'll probably see more growth um for uh for more wireless connectivity for more dense networks as it as this uh mentioned before um fiber deeper to these homes um i happen to have a fiber connection it's been really good at my house so um but um i know a lot of uh, uh parts of uh, the us that just don't have fiber to, to homes yet um so you know as, as we come out of this and grow that we've all uh, learned how we can work from home now um, do we need uh, bigger, dense fiber networks to, to our homes, to our businesses? So we're going to have all these different edge technologies like LiDAR and, um, you, you know, you're going to see um, some more uh, radar and video, et cetera. But ultimately, it's all collecting big, fat amounts of data. And it's going back into the clay. It goes through the pipes, and we're sort of mastering the building of the pipe part. But then it gets back to these silos and it goes through the cloud and cities are gathering this data, but almost to, almost every single city that speaks says, we got the data, we don't have the funds or the expertise to properly use it to get the outcomes that promise smart, right? So Scott, you guys are experts in, in the cloud and security. Um, talk a little bit about how, how what you see there in the trends and in perhaps if cities are working with you to build uh, portals or where do you see uh, the next direction there? Yeah, so for um, for all the bad things that, that hurricanes <laughs> caused down here, um, I do remember back a couple of years ago, back uh, right after Hurricane Harvey in 2017, and that was a third consecutive year to have a 500 year flood in this area. So you can imagine the amount of water that passed through here and all the, the you know disruptions to um, the, you know, the economy and so forth. But Houston mayor talked about rebuilding uh, as a smart city at that point. And he had a really clear idea. He had a vision. He wanted to, to move and migrate all the, the computers and data um, to the cloud. He wanted to um, strengthen the partnership with Microsoft and, and go to Azure. He wanted to modernize um, all the technologies that were, the city was using. Um, he wanted to adapt and grow the economy um, with the technology. And um, so what he did was um, he, uh, uh, he went and created a, a smart city advisory council. He went out and spent, uh, I think it was a little over $34 million on new smart traffic signals, wireless communications, uh, digital message signs. And um, essentially he wanted to create a connected infrastructure um, as a smart city. And of course, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest challenges that you're going to face when doing that is, um, is is getting all the people needed to say yes to those kinds of decisions. So the policymakers, the industry business leaders, all the neighborhoods, and just every other stakeholder um, to try to help cut through the red tape. And um, so at the end of the day, um, that can help expedite the process of Houston becoming a world class and smart city. Um, but without their buy in, um, that process is going to take a lot longer. So that's it from the city. And so we're seeing that, of course, a lot from our customers as well, as more and more data is being uh, gathered and, and tried to uh, assemble and analyze and produce the sort of information that they really need to make those right decisions 
you know, we're seeing that a little bit more and more. Well, you hit on something there that I didn't prepare to talk about, but I do want to mention um, it, the journey to becoming a smart city is a collaborative uh, event, uh, a series of events, and it requires this ecosystem of collaborators with different skill sets. And the response to this crisis shows that, you know, that we have different uh, General Motors is making ventilators suddenly, right? Uh, civic duty. Well, we see that a lot in building the smart city where local talent, sometimes major companies, other small companies, innovate around the very specific need of that city, but it's a translatable need to another city. So they, that starts to move along. But what it, most importantly that I've seen to have an organized smart city is that there is a group, like you said, that Houston group, uh, Dallas has the Dallas Innovation Alliance, and that was so successful, they just started the North Texas Innovation Alliance, uh, same leadership. But it helped rally around and organize those those uh, efforts. Uh, other places in North Carolina, um, the Raleigh area has Riot, Raleigh Internet of Things, um, very very strong. They work with all the universities and they have help build collaboration. And they've won some like 20 million in grants to develop 5G and drone technology. Right. So these groups in, to the audience um, in your local market seek these out because it's both opportunity. Uh, to sell, but it's also a great opportunity to be civically minded and contribute to the um, the thought leadership of your city. And, and, and every voice is kind of important, particularly the technical folks who can talk about what's possible and what it costs, um, because some of these things are just out of reach for cities and others can be built like collaboratively. Um, we talk about network densification. Robert, are any of your clients like the Crown Castles and uh, the, that new wave of comm infrastructure provider beyond the carriers or who, who's looking to build new dense networks in this in the city in the major cities uh, m most of the carriers are right so they they, mm -hmm. they need denser networks um, pretty much uh, every carrier that I can think of uh, today needs needs more fiber to to deploy to small cells I mean small cells I mean we will bring two to six fibers per street light pole just for you know one small cell so when you think about the amount of fibers that is need that is needed to, to deploy small cell in 5g uh it's 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 a pretty dense network so we, we see a lot of them actually most of them uh, uh deploying uh, bigger networks you know which brings well, to another issue our infrastructure in, in a lot of these cities is is um is old it's outdated it needs uh, it needs to be upgraded it needs to be overbuilt i mean we you know we kind of uh, what i call put band-aids on it all the time and they're always just adding just uh for what's needed at the time um, but that's why we need these cities to to collaborate together with their agencies and all put one group together and, and, and cut through all the red tape uh, because that's you know the carriers are out there wanting to build we have the the cities and the agencies that are i wouldn't say stopping it but there's too many roadblocks and too many too much red tape to get through to, to, to get these projects deployed oh yeah and you know there's all the litigation that went around the small cell and the fcc and all of that noise uh, uh we're actually doing an event in san jose uh, and they have another one with a great group it's called silicon valley joint venture and they help bring together all those resources in san jose and one of the other conclusions we came up with is what you just touched on, Robert, to become a smart city, if you don't have some sort of carrier or cable co-partner and the utility in a triangle with the city collaborating on that dense infrastructure, which includes energy as well as communications, then you just can't get there. It's just it's that big a heavy lift. But many cities have uh, implemented smart poles. I walk around New York and you see a uniform look in New York now with the small cells. I do deploy a lot of like shrouds onto existing light poles. Is that how you meet the aesthetic requirement? I mean, how does, you yeah. know, or do you have to drop new poles? How is that working? In, in, um, in, in the New York City market, it's pretty much existing poles. Um, they don't want to see new poles go up in, uh, in the New York market. So um, they're going on existing traffic signal poles. They go on uh, standard street light poles. We also put them on uh, wood utility poles. Um, it's all a standard mm -hmm. uh, standard shroud that's out there for uh, for our New York market. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 my wife thinks I'm a little strange, but every city I go to, I walk around and take pictures of the light poles and the small cells. But uh, that's another story. And you can see pictures of those on the website as well. Uh, but um, that said, um, yeah, so that's a major uh, direction um, with the small cells. But let, let's come back to ITS and some more of these uh, smart city type services. Um, Kyle, you de you de uh, discussed a little bit about uh, how you design these, but talk about the different technologies that go into building the solution that you uh, that you'll deploy to to create ITS. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you no, know, when you think about ITS, you have to have to first figure out what it is you're you know you're trying to accomplish, and then you can leverage from that. But you also need to be smart enough to try future proof that that core infrastructure um, you have a lot of different groups a lot of different competing interests and so you have to try to try to put in place a plan that that meets all of those I'll give you an example in in Herndon Virginia we deployed a city uh, project in uh, in a particular part of the city um, you know they there was there was fiber there there's wireless aspect there's public Wi-Fi there's you know joint use 5g poles so all of the carriers in that can come to that area, can work off the same pole, and that's a little bit of a paradigm shift in itself. You know, smart lighting, pedestrian counting, electrical, electric vehicle charging systems. So you you figure out each one of those things that we're trying to accomplish, and every every jurisdiction is different. But we, you know, we take that into account, and then and work backwards from there, and then figure out what resources you have. But it's really key, uh, going back to what you and Robert were talking about, of of having you know having a group or a champion. Um, that really understands what you're trying to accomplish and, and can help help bridge that gap between the technology, uh, the end user, the municipality, and, and the you know the, the ever important budget. Has the term uh, curb management uh, been cropping up uh, in your world at all? That has. It's uh, it's it's recently become something that we've we've been started to talk about, and we're developing a solution right now um, for a particular city, a, a large city that's that's worried about you know loading zones and unloading zones and parking during different times of and different events and 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 to help maintain you know you know just a good traffic flow, but also handle emergency yep. events. So yeah, it sure is. It's become a huge capability, a huge need because of Uber and Lyft and all of the yeah, different, uh, all of the, the gig economy that's now happening that wants that curb. Um, so, uh, you know, anyway, so that that's a concept anyway in the smart city space that's very important. Uh, another one, I mean, the, we talked about smart lighting, but probably the genesis of smart cities uh, where cities could find funding was the smart grid applications, right? They built uh, these smart grids for the utilities. Isaac, your company has a lot of uh, experience in that space. Talk about the network and the different components that you have to put together to build the smart grid, and what's the next generation of smart grid? So, um, uh, yeah, I can write a book on that. <laughs> uh, it, it, before that, let me let me provide a couple of comments on uh, points uh, that were discussed. You know, one is uh, collaboration. Uh, you know, especially in this highly bureaucratic um, environment. Um, it's, uh, you know, one thing that COVID-19 is going to do, um, I firmly believe in that, is that it is going to trigger and it's going to force uh, different stakeholders to collaborate with each other. We've already, especially for if, if societies want to deal with this uh, effectively and minimize the impact on economy, we've, we've already seen that, you know, in, in the province of Hubei, how Alibaba and everyone else stepped up and how they collaborated with the cities and um, you know uh, for us here in Canada or in the US um, that's the only way to do it uh, so it will have to be uh, done cities will be forced to uh, collaborate you know companies like ours will be forced to collaborate uh, with our peers in the industry who may even be competitive so that is one thing that is going to change uh, the other is you know we talked about these all these different components of technologies coming into play that's where interoperability is is going to uh, you know play a big role you know that's the next step of that collaboration and that's where standard based um, you know and uh, say in the connectivity world nowadays 3GPP compliance for all the different components that uh, becomes very important and that is you know when we talk about smart grid uh, you know smart grid uh, 
uh, in the utility industry, I'd say when it comes to digital transformation, uh, it is one of the first industries in mission critical um, infrastructure that uh, went after the smarts, adding intelligence to the grid. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, if I remember correctly, Department of Energy, you know, via the Smart Grid Investment Grant Program um, under Obama administration, uh, you know, they funded about eight billion dollars worth of projects you know there were close to 100 projects and there's uh, there's a whole bucket of lessons that we've learned from that and you know i always go around uh, you know telling my peers in these other industries that guys it's one thing to create a solution theoretically it's another thing to deploy it. Um, and i think the biggest lesson from that program uh, is, you know if if we go and review the report and everything is you know, when it comes to uh, interoperability, so system integration, think about that. Think about piloting and properly, uh, you know, testing your equipment um, uh, with all this new technology, uh, making sure the different technology components work together with each other. Uh, you know, what are the cybersecurity risks? Uh, um, associated with adding this new connectivity to it. You know, there's, there's significant new processes that need to be built within these organizations. Yes, it's complex, but it's doable. And we've already uh, done a lot uh, here in North America. And, you know, now in Asia, in response to COVID-19, countries there are adding their own perspective to how projects like these can be done. So, uh, you know, that's where collaboration comes into play again. It's, it's not just for smart cities, but it's across these uh, industries, especially the mission critical infrastructure industry on which these economies depend. Well, you mentioned, uh, Jamie, did you want to jump in? If you don't mind, gentlemen, I um, I know we're tight for time, but um, watching these questions on the question board and they're 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 fabulous. I was gonna try to squeeze one last question in if that works. Um, I'm grouping a few together just to get a couple couple of uh, folks in here. Dr. A. B. Munir and Liliana Rochia. Um, you know, their their questions really center around what's the human factor. How's how um, how in your organizations with the impact of COVID-19. How, how have uh, how have people been impacted? Um, and I I don't know if uh, a couple of you guys wanted to just uh, end in those closing notes. Rob, maybe. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's hit home here in our company. You know, we've we we have a few cases of COVID nineteen. Um, thankfully, everyone's uh, recovering from that. Um, you know, we are uh, an essential workforce, so we do need to deploy our crews to keep this infrastructure up and going. Um, but we have adapted a lot to 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 make it a safe work environment for, for all of our personnel. I've seen on your LinkedIn feeds to um, your pictures of your of your workers yes. out there, unsung heroes for sure. Yes, for sure. yes. Kyle, you probably have a similar similar scenario. Yeah, we we have we have crews uh, in in a similar fashion as Roberts um, out there working every day, keeping the keeping the infrastructure uh, maintained and, and new infrastructure going in to support all these these new initiatives. Um, you know, but we're a uh, you know we're we're focused as a you know a remote workforce, so we're 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 pretty well adapted, and we had very little learning curve to to getting this going. But we're 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 up and moving, and our crews are all out uh, getting stuff done. And of course, funding is a major issue for smart cities. So all of this uh, shipping and all these dollars moving is going to probably have an effect on how cities approach these technologies right. and fund them. Exactly. Thank you, everyone, for your insights on smart cities, IoT, and this new world of COVID-19 that we find ourselves in. Again, our all-star panelists, Scott Ward, Emerging Technology Principal at TBI, Rob DeLeo, Chairman of Highland, Kyle Hildebrand, Vice President of EX Squared Technology, Isaac Mian, Vice President at Redline Communications, and a big thank you, of course, to our guest moderator, Peter Murray, Executive Director of Dense Networks, for keeping us on point today. And a quick reminder, many of our speakers are, have agreed to stay on for the remaining lunch hour to answer any more of your questions on LinkedIn. So. Uh, if you go right into our chat, we have a, a direct link, but you can also just search on hashtag JSA virtual roundtable, all one word, 
um, uh, to, to also get to us, but we'd love to continue the chat and get to so many other unanswered questions. Uh, Peter was so fabulous to have like 12 prepared for us. Um, uh, and of course the chat uh, box has been, has been going great too. Uh, so we do want to get to you guys. Let's, let's bring this over to LinkedIn where we can maybe uh, get, get to several more uh, imminently. And viewers, if you were one of the very first 100 registrants, again, we had 250, so sadly that's less than half, sorry. Uh, but if you were one of our first 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your lunch here on JSA. And go ahead and visit us at jsa.net to register for upcoming JSA virtual roundtables, including, of course, our new series on exploring the impact of COVID-19 on our industry and client verticals. Next one up, May 7, three weeks from now, we talk through the pandemic's impact of healthcare networks. That's a wrap from, from our end. Look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon, Tuesday, actually. It will be dropping on JSA TV and JSA podcast. That's on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. Anywhere you're looking, you'll find it. Uh, meantime, see you over on LinkedIn. Happy virtual networking and stay safe, my friends. Thank you. Thank you.